Hi everybody, this is Father Bill Holtzinger, pastor of Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Beaverton, Oregon, and this is your Friday Reflection. That's right. It's my Friday Reflection as well. <laughs> well, I want to um, share with you a reading that we're not that I'm not going to preach about this weekend. Uh, we're, I'm going to preach about the first, or use the first reading and the gospel for the homily this weekend, but I thought instead of um, just skipping over it, I thought maybe I would read it for you here on this Friday Reflection, and then offer you a reflection, but not my own, necessarily. I'd like to offer you a reflection from this text called The Word of the Lord, which was written by John Bergsma. It's a set of reflections of the Sunday readings of year A. With that, if you will allow me, I will also make commentary about John Bergsma's commentary. He's great. So here we go. When I came to you, this again, first to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or wisdom, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of spirit and power, so that your faith might not your faith might, so that your faith might rest not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. So clearly, St. Paul was very active, and the Holy Spirit was with him, and amazing miracles were happening uh, through him. So this is what John Bergsman writes. He says, he writes, St. Paul was not, trained, was not a trained Greek orator. But the Greeks placed high value on the art of rhetoric, especially in ancient and wealthy seats of Greek culture like the city of Corinth. In this passage, the apostle defends himself against those who ridiculed him and his message because his Greek was common and his thought shaped by Jewish rather than Hellenistic standards of argument. Hellenistic, think of, um, uh, think of like the Greek culture. That'd be the Hellenistic culture. St. Paul points out that the power of God, the power of the, of the good news of Jesus is not dependent on rhetoric or literary devices, but on reality. The Holy Spirit has the power to transform lives, to forgive sins, to heal sickness of body and soul, and to lead us into eternal life with God. These are realities facts, not word pictures or theatrical oratories. In other words, not using similes or metaphors, word pictures, things like that, trying to uh, tickle the ear and give sharp thoughts. I mean, think about this. In one sense, this is what, as, as a homilist, I would do. I would try to use my words and speech to try to encourage and inspire people. Um, but St. Paul is saying this is not the center, really, to be flashy and to be uh, eloquent in speech. And in fact, if you've heard me enough, I stumble a lot. In fact, this is my, I think, third attempt, at least at this particular video. Really, serious. Yeah. He continues, those who seek to, those who seek, there you go, see, I'm messing up. Those who seek a show may not be impressed with the cross of Christ which is a sorry spectacle when viewed with the eyes of entertainment. I mean, think about it really, right? If I want to be entertained, why would I go see that? I mean, that's the most gruesome thing possible. And then to even talk about it, even in our modern day, we might even actually have domesticated the cross. Like, yeah, good Jesus, there's a cross. We may have even beautiful crucifixes and nothing wrong with that. But let's don't forget that it's not about fashion, and it's not about entertainment. He continues, This applies also to our modern forms of worship. Great preaching and great music are well and good, and by all means, let's try to honor the Mass with the best possible. And you know what? I think we do quite a good job at that. I mean, I've been trying to work out what I call homily haircuts, chop chop here, right? Trying to keep them short. Uh, you may know that uh, in my previous assignment, and if you look at my podcast, I would give um, a homily that would be 15, 20 minutes, right? 
And now I'm giving between eight and nine, maybe 10 minutes in a homily. And our music, uh, when I arrived, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Now it's one thing to watch it on video, by the way. It's not, I mean, it's good to actually listen to the homily. It's also good to listen to the uh, music, even if you're at home on, let's say, the, the stream we've got. But it's something wholly different in person. There's some things that have an event character to them, and they just cannot be compared to something virtual. So when I arrived, I was like, wow, the power of the music. It's amazing. But again, is that the center? Is that really the center? John Bergsma is saying no, and neither is the preaching. Though, though, uh, when we are reflecting, our, a lot of our philosophy at the parish is to be mindful of three things. Three things. That is, number one, hospitality. Number two, good preaching. And number three, good music. These are what pull people in. We recognize that. But that's a, a, a tool we use so that people will be fed and come to know Jesus. And hopefully that they will grow to the point where like, for example, our daily mass grew. If you come to the daily mass, there is no music, and my homily is shorter, and I don't even have to do a homily because it's not the center. There, the focus is truly on what's the center, which is the Eucharist. Yes, we hear the word proclaimed. That gets us ready for the Eucharist. Again, he's saying that by all means, let's try to honor the mass with the best possible. But these cannot be the basis of our faith. Now, let's think about that. Are those the things that we have as our basis of faith and does that allow us or does that encourage us to maybe shop around? A lot of church shopping happens. I recognize that. But is that the center? Or are we looking to the ephemeral? Things that are, are not as important. Yes, they're good. And yes, they can inspire us. And I hope they do here at Holy Trinity. But remember the center. Preachers and musicians, he continues, come and go. The reason for our attendance at worship should be to witness again the miracle of the cross and resurrection enacted before our eyes in the Holy Eucharist. It's not impressive by the world standards, but you can see a better show, and you can see a better show on television or in the local theater or stadium. I mean, think about it. Like after Mass last week, I came home and I watched the playoffs. It was very entertaining and uh, amazing what happened in some of the games. Now, I would say not so much the, uh, the 49ers and Eagles game. That was, sadly, that was a blowout and incredibly bad sportsmanship. But let's just say the Cincinnati Bengals and the Kansas City Chiefs was an amazing game down to the very end. Continuing. But it is a demonstration of, that is, speaking of the liturgy, it's a demonstration of spirit and power when bread and wine is transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And it does have real transformative power in our lives, provided we receive it in faith and not disbelief. So this is important because, again, a question. When we come to church, when we come to Mass, are we aware of what we're doing? So especially when we come to the Eucharist, when communion time comes, walking come forward and receiving the Eucharist. This is precious, but are we paying attention? Are we really present? When the minister says the body of Christ and holds it in front of us, is that what we're looking at? And are we cradling it either in our hands or receiving it in our mouth with great reverence? Last week, uh, someone came forward for communion who I did not recognize and didn't quite oh, try, try to receive the Eucharist uh, in a way that would be common, and I was confused. I gave him a communion, and then he proceeded to walk away with it. And I had to stop him and say, hey, sir, you need to eat that right now, or I was going to take it back. And he put it in his mouth. After Mass, now I thought that was it, but after Mass, someone who's not even a Christian of ours, who is an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion from another church out of state who was visiting, said she was behind this gentleman, and after he put it in his mouth, he started walking away, and then took it out of his mouth. 
she shared this with me. She did not know what happened to it. So I looked. I went back into the pews where supposedly he had sat. I found nothing, and a couple other people tried to help out. Eventually, our mass coordinator was looking around and found the host on the floor. Um, that's, that's really bad. And so we then needed to take the host and repose it, not in the ciborium, but we reposed it by either eating it, and I believe our uh, liturgy coordinator did eat it, which is uh, remarkable since somebody else had already had it in their mouth, right? But I've had situations where uh, someone came to me, another, this is uh, when I was in Forest Grove many years ago at St. Anthony, and somebody brought me their music issue, and two pages were bonded together. And they were wondering, Father, what's going on? What is this? And I opened it up, and what was bonding it together was something round. And yes, it was a host. Someone, sometime before this, probably a week or so, because it was quite dry, took a host into their mouth, and then instead of eating it, put it in the book and closed the book. This is our Lord Jesus. Now, some people might say that, well, th that means we shouldn't be receiving the Eucharist in our, in our hands. That will stop this. I'm like, I it would not have stopped this necessarily. I already had the, the example I just had where I, the person had it in their mouth, then took it out of their mouth. And he still dropped it on the floor. Now, with the case of the host in the music book, I tore out the page and then tore out the paper around the host, and I just ate it right then and there. We can do this, though. This is another option, is take that host to the sacristy, put it in a bowl of water. It's called an ablution bowl, or a bowl of water. And let it sit there and dissolve, and then we pour the remains down the saquarium, which is a special sink in the, in the sacristy, which then goes straight into the ground, which has been blessed. Yeah, it's tough. This is stuff that, uh, it is hard. So that's why the sacraments are for those who believe. And I don't know what this person was doing there. If I see him again, I will refuse him communion because he did not know he, what he was doing, clearly didn't want it. And if I can get a chance, I would love to have a conversation with him. I would encourage you, if you see somebody who's receiving communion and then takes it out of their mouth or starts walking away and somehow we didn't notice that, to please approach them with kindness and charity and remind them, say, you must eat this or you take it and then you eat it. And then let me know so that we can discern what happened, so we can kind of repair these things. Um, try to see if we can do better. I may make an announcement at Mass. I, I mean, I've been talking to our committee for uh, liturgy this uh, week, and I shared this story, and the question is, should I remind people how to receive communion? And I certainly do this every time there is a funeral, because lots of people from traditions unknown come, and they don't know what to do. And I would say then, well, I give those instructions to people. If you have somebody that comes with you who does not know that the Eucharist is so precious to us, that we believe is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, and is not prepared, is not Catholic, is not received their First Communion, to give them that instructions on how to receive, if they come forward, that kind blessing. They come up, put their hands, you know, over their shoulders, and then the minister would say, may Christ be with you. We need to do this. This was that was a kind of tough way to end the Sunday because that was the eleven o'clock mass. But it was what it was, and I always wonder, well, okay, God, what are you going to do with this? Uh, we're going to do our best, and this is your deal. And I, I surrender to you what it is, uh, what people have done to you in the Eucharist. You've made yourself so vulnerable. Okay, so this is the last paragraph from John Bergsma. Sunday Mass may not be as exciting, he puts, in air, he puts in quotes, and I'm putting in air quotes, perhaps as the presentation, let me start this again. Sunday Mass may not be as exciting, perhaps, as the presentation put on by a mega church down the road, uh, but Mass is real, a brute fact, not just words. Preaching and music may have been more impressive somewhere else, but the crucified Christ is really present where are present here under the form of bread and wine for those who wish to receive him. So that's my reflection of a reflection on the second the second reading from 1 Corinthians uh, this weekend. Uh, 
I would ask you some, some prayers as I continue to formulate the homily for this coming weekend. I'm going to take the first reading in the gospel. And I'm kind of focusing right now on, in the first reading, how we're to give of ourselves. And in the second reading, or the gospel, we hear that we are to be salt of the earth and in the light to the world. That means God has given us gifts, and we're not to, we're not to put those gifts under a bushel basket, not to hide our gifts. To be actually humble in giving of ourselves and what that means, and not under depreciating ourselves, deprecating ourselves, and not, not over exaggerating or exaggerating our, who we are and our abilities, but to be who God has made us and to be aware and peaceful and content in that space. So that's, that's the basics of the homily. I uh, pray that I will be able to kind of flesh it out some so that it will help you to dig more deeply about that message from the scriptures. And that from that, when you receive the Eucharist, you'll be more prepared to receive the amazing gifts of grace that Christ has for you. I hope to see you this weekend. I'm Father Bill from Holy Trinity in Beaverton. God bless you, and I'll see you this weekend. Bye-bye.